Heather Egan. Ladies. And I'll welcome you too to the Racine Public Library. Um, we've talked in the last months about all the friends, and Steve just talked about his friend, all the friends of Preservation Racine, the numerous speakers, and the wonderful venues offered for our meetings. And tonight we are honored to be at the Racine Public Library. I know it's a place you've all visited and loved through the years. A public place for all of us to share, enjoy, and learn. And we all feel very welcome here. I just heard Jerry Ritter saying what library could be more beautiful than the Racine Public Library. And I think that is true with all the views and the accommodations and the generosity of letting us use it tonight. And I thank Jessica McPhail for making the accommodations for us to get together tonight. And to Rebecca, who changed her hours. Where is Rebecca? Right there she is. Right, they your work. She kneels, too. <laughs> she changed her hours to have the library open a little later tonight for our meeting. And we thank you all. It's summer and life is good. So just a few updates to our meetings that are coming up. Um, now, we are taking a vacation from meetings in August so that you can all take time no, to July. enjoy your summer. July. We're taking a vacation from July. July. That's true. <laughs> Thank you, Vivian. <laughs> I have August written down. Why I don't know. <laughs> so you could all take time to enjoy your vacations and relaxations. And our next meeting is on August 6th. It's changed from what we told you originally, and I hope you've forgotten what we told you originally. <laughs> but it is going to be August 6th. So, um, and it's going to be at the Cesar Chavez Center, which some of us remember as Douglas Park. And our speaker will be Reverend Bill Grimble, who grew up, who grew up very near the, uh, the center. He is a writer and storyteller who will reminisce about the days he grew up on the north side of Racine. And this fall we have plans for a meeting at Twin Disc as they celebrate their 100th anniversary. On November 5th, we will meet at the Golden Rondell to welcome Jennifer Deval from the State Historic Preservation Office of the Wisconsin Historical Society in Madison. She will speak on the 10 worst things you can do to a historic building. And you'll all want to know what that is. <laughs> And on Monday, December 3rd, we will celebrate Christmas as we did last year at the 5th Street Yacht Club with a speaker you all love last Christmas, Rochelle Pennington. She will tell us the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald. So mark your calendars because exciting meetings are coming up. And the program committee is always eager to hear your suggestions and your ideas, maybe of speakers or events that you've either seen or heard about, so we're always eager to hear about that. Jan, you can tell Jan Carter or me or Vivian or Pat Murphy if you have ideas. Um, I've been emphasizing all year the many friends of Preservation Racine. A lot of them have shared their knowledge and their expertise. With us in February was Steve Rogstead, then Jim Mercier, Michael Rayberg, Pippin McKelly, and tonight another longtime faithful friend. Now, I have to tell you, I was a little worried because I didn't know how to pronounce his name and his last name. The first name I knew how to pronounce. <laughs> but the last name was a little tricky for me. But somebody said, well, it's easy. There's a wow in Kowowski. Kowowski. Well, there sure is. If you've ever visited Jerry's Oak Clearing, and I know many of you have, Preservation Racine has had several meetings there, then you know there is a wow in Kowalski. If you haven't seen Jerry's five decade, decades of collections, his blacksmith shop, um, the relic-filled barn, you must take the next opportunity to visit. It is a wow. If you saw the acclaimed national television show, The Pickers, um, that featured Jerry and Oak Clearing and his Racine collections, you know that program was a wow. 
If you've ever heard any of Jerry's historic talks and presentations, then you've said, wow. If you've ever wanted to know details about Racine's past, Racine history, just ask Jerry. He will wow you with all his knowledge. Just a few more wows. Jerry has written booklets and newspaper articles about Racine's past and has entertained hundreds of groups with a, a slideshow called Racine History. Um, he has shared, he has served as a Racine Landmarks Commodore, um, uh, Commissioner. Commissioner. <laughs> she wrote, she a commissioner. Wrote, oh, you wrote she it. She wrote. <laughs> no, not this. She wrote the the reading notice. So she, <laughs> and as a trustee of the Racine County Historical Society, a collector for five decades, and I had to say it again, five decades, he has gathered one of the largest. Uh, largest collections of Racine history in Racine County. Wow. Tonight, I know you'll be saying wow after hearing Jerry's presentation, History of the J.I. Case Company. So please welcome Gerald Kowalski. <laughs> well, uh, I want to vote. We're having technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. Well, we, you can talk to him about all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I can talk to him. You know, how, how can I... You talk to them about the American Pickers. American Pickers, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, Stephen Rockstead with all his beautiful language, and he's such an orator. And he would have <laughs> old Abe. <laughs> or, I'm sorry. One of the old Abe's is his pet project. <laughs> Abe Lincoln. And my old Abe is the Case Eagle. <clears throat> Since the computer isn't working, this may blow up if it, work, if it doesn't work. But anyways, I started at GI Case in 1966. It's hard to imagine when I started, there was 3,500 people working in their factory at that time. That's not including the office help, the people incorporated that. This is just working men. So in April of 1966, I go and put my application in at 8 o'clock in the morning. By the time I got home, my mother said, go back to the case, they want to talk to you. The uh, employment manager said, how long do you plan on staying? <laughs> well, I need clothes for summer, uh, insurance for the car, you know, some spending money for summer. It was all about summer. I was 18 years old. <laughs> all about summer. Okay. If the boss will hire you, we'll take you. So I go and I go in this million square foot plant asking where this boss is. Nobody knows him. Nobody knows the department. I finally find him. And then he said, oh, hang on, I'll hire you. We'll see if the doctor's still in. So I called the doctor's office and I went down there and there's about 25 people lined up. And he's checking for hernias. <laughs> and then he takes the stick, and he's taking a new stick and going down. I, for years, I looked to see if anybody was even close to my seniority that started that day. Nobody was even close. So I go back to the boss. You start at 3 o'clock that afternoon. Whirlwind, 18-year-old kid. Whirlwind, here I'm working at J.I. Case. You know, 30 years later, I retired, 48 years old. I want to tell you, for me, this eagle was the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me and my family. It was a roller coaster where you hated it sometime if you had a bad supervisor. Other times, you just loved it. But I recall, you know, I think about Case and I recall sitting there back in like 1971 thinking that millions of people would want my job because it was such a good job. It was dirty, smoky, but it paid well, and it was a good job. So anyways, I get involved in local history. And we talked about preservation racing. I don't know, when did it start, 76? 
Somewhere around 76, 75? 73. 73. So I got involved about 77, right in that time period, 77, 78. And that, so I was involved with Preservation Racine because I collected bottles. And Roberta Feeney asked me, could you bring some Dr. Shoop bottles? We're having an open house at the Shoop House. Could you bring a couple bottles and talk about it? That got me involved with Preservation Racine. <coughs> so anyways, I was a bottle collector and the case company caught on that I was a bottle collector. So they put me in their company magazine. You know, the bottle man, history buff, <laughs> you know. And here it says I got 39 albums of Racine history. That's, that's not even, you know, 39 albums, what is it? Now I have filing cabinets and <laughs> boxes and boxes everywhere. But what's unique about this, man that knows about his beer and the picture I'm holding is soda pop bottle. <laughs> the girl doesn't know the difference. <laughs> but the reason I got in the case, Mark, is because I had contact with the communications director and uh, he was looking for old case photographs. You know. I said, well, I'll help you out. So I was getting him case photographs to copy. Then one day, he calls me up and he says, Jerry, you're not going to believe this. We got a call from down at the main works and they had six filing cabinets full of case photographs. And they asked, what should we do with them? Should we throw them out? What are we going to do with them? <laughs> and he said, we got them here in the office. You got to come and see these. They're absolutely amazing. <clears throat> and here it's 100 years of steam engines and J.I. Case and his wife and his cars and the, everything you could think of, you know. But because I had been gathering things and helping them, they said, why don't you take a few photographs for yourself? Anything that has one, more than one photograph in there, take it, you know. So I'm sitting here with this whole bank of filing cabinets, cherry picking it to what I wanted. So the only, the only thing they asked is to share it with people. And I've been doing that all along. You're good. In 1983, there was a newspaper called the Racine. And they did a special edition. And I was able to use a lot of those photographs. I think there's about 12 pages. Uh -uh, that one's missing. Yeah. There's about 12 pages. I wonder what happened to that one. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? These, you can't even find these old, old newspapers anymore. But yeah, there was, you know, 12 pages. And uh, I'll tell you a little story about it. We did the article, and then I went to the Shoreline Leader and I questioned him why my byline wasn't on the, on the story. And they said, they said Case Company asked not to put it on there. And then I was at a uh, preservation racine meeting at Jordan Hall, and a gentleman from Case was speaking about Case. And I asked him, what did, did you, how, what did you think of that story that was in the Shoreline Leader? And he said, oh, the one that I wrote? <laughs> oh. And I, you wrote, you know? And then he changed the subject. Uh, yeah. And then later on, he came up to me, oh, were you the one that helped with the, the story? <laughs> well, he did write a little bit of modern, you know, in the, in, in the uh, introduction, you know? in that and I was livid I mean I was <laughs> I was really upset and then a very intelligent friend of mine sat me down and he said Jerry that guy probably went to Harvard he's, he's a corporate manager he probably went to Harvard and your story was good enough for him to say it was his? <laughs> you should be honored. Uh, uh, okay. 
it isn't that you know it isn't that good but it was an easy one for him to grab i mean you know what the heck so here i am 30 some years later 50 years later yeah 52 years later i could still be working there because i'm healthy enough where i could still be working there if i would have but i retired at 48 uh the biggest thing was that uh my father had died at 49 his brother at 50 our family has heart trouble and i thought my god if i'm going to die that young i'm going to retire early and then they they took the cap of what you could earn off and so at 48 years old 30 and out i was able to retire and the worst scenario would you need more money go get another job you know never had to do it so it was wonderful Good. I hope you kids get it going. I oh. know. <laughs> Send help. Talk about American Pickers. All right. Anybody want to hear about the American Pickers? <laughs> Some of you have heard about the American Pickers already. They were at my home. They picked my collection. My daughter, Aria, set it up without my knowledge. They had called me every year since that program came on because people would tell, you know, <coughs> did you talk to Jerry and Union Grove? And every time I more or less talked them out of it. And they told me I was too neat, too, too organized. They wanted, you know, raccoon infested buildings and, and that. So then uh, the kids came over and said, Dad, the American Pickers want to talk to you. I don't want to talk to them. Because for a number of years they, they call and then, well, we'll get back with you, which they never did. And that, but they said, really, they want to talk to you. Now this was on a Thursday in the afternoon. Ah, no, I don't want nothing to do with it. Well, at least, or was it Wednesday? It was on a Wednesday. Uh -huh. They said at least Skype with them. Well, okay, so they set up the computer and the webcam and all that, and uh, which we're having trouble enough. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. So I Skyped with one of the producers, and then again, well, we'll call you, you know, see if they're interested or not, you know. So we no more packed everything away, and the phone rings, will you be home at 10 o'clock tomorrow? <laughs> yeah, you know. Don't clean anything, uh, don't put anything out you think they want to buy, uh, you know, don't dress in any uh, outfits with like, uh, corporate names on and things like that, just kind of plain. So you, you turn around and go to sleep and the next morning you eat breakfast and then all of a sudden at 10 o'clock, here comes the caravan, you know, into the driveway. They, the, the photographers and the producers spent nine hours. <clears throat> it was really amazing. Uh, and then Mike and Frank spent about four. Uh, they primarily, Mike was interested in some bicycles, and they were interested in some toys. And it's interesting because they paid cash for everything that wasn't on camera, and they paid me with a check for everything they showed on camera. They knew when they left there exactly what they were gonna use. And they bought more for themselves than they did for the program. <laughs> you know? Is there any questions about the American Pickers? I know one question is, it, you know, is it staged? Yeah. No! <laughs> the only thing I was told to do is when they drive up, you know, say hi. <laughs> so they drove up and I said hi. And then after that, they went around with flashlights and like, what about this and what about that? And it went just like a lot of them. No, that's not for sale. No, that's not for sale. <coughs> My daughter came up to me and she said, you gotta sell them something. That's what they're there for. Eh, okay. Then you get into the selling mode and you start letting things go. You know, I, I have little regrets, but not much. Not much at all. You know, well, I guess we may not have pictures, but Case came to Racine County in 1842. And he ended up settling in Rochester, which the, was the main spot for the wheat belt in that in Racine County. 
Racine, this was a forest. This was not good farmland here. The farmers were all out west of here. So he settled out there, what was kind of called the Western Grain Belt. And he brought a number of groundhog threshing machines with him. He sold some along the way, and then he kept one for thrashing. <coughs> well, he did pretty well. He uh, rebuilt his machine and he made it better, so he decided to start building them. Because manufacturing was in its infancy, and a lot of farmers needed these machines. <laughs> if anybody can do it, they can. So anyways, he wanted to have water rights in Rochester to the, water, the dam so he could build a small factory there to manufacture these thrashing machines. And the Elas and the, the village fathers out there said, no way, no more races on the on the dam, we don't have enough water power now. So he came to Racine in 1844. He started building, he rented a building, started building these thrashing machines in a small way. By the late 1840s, he built a 30 by 90 three-story building. Probably the largest brick building in the city at that time. One of them, anyways. He was a young man, he was in his 20s. The old guys were saying, what is this guy? But, you know, he's going to crash. But building this big fancy building and everything like that. Well, one of the cases, things, when he went out to sell his thrashing machines, a lot of time the farmers couldn't pay. So he took chickens and eggs and potatoes, whatever they, and then the next time they needed a machine, they went to J.I. Case because he was their friend. The company grew. Pretty soon, one factory after another, the main works was growing, they're tearing churches down, buildings, moving houses, and the main works was born. <coughs> you know, uh, growing up in the 1950s in Racine, and 60s, the whistles at the Case main works were still blowing, you know? It, you could hear them at noon. <laughs> You know, almost all of my neighbors were deaf. <laughs> they had them little boxes, you know, with the earplug, and they're always adjusting the box. They worked at J.I. Case because a lot of them were close to the factory. And at the factory, noise, I mean, the big hammers and different things to make this was amazing. So first there was the main works. Case had died in 1891, December of 1891. So don't be fooled when you go and see the Case Mausoleum that says 1892 in Mount Cemetery because he actually died in 1891. But it was so late in the year, December's 23rd or right around there, that they just figured he died in 92. So you can't really trust what's carved in stone. <laughs> Great, Dad. I'm doing great. You're doing great with that phone. <laughs> You're doing wonderful. You all already know this. Well, anyways, Case was a horseman. He loved wonderful horses. He had a beautiful farm called Hickory Grove Farm. Uh, on Hickory Grove Farm, there was an amazing barn, and that barn was by Roosevelt Park, where Roosevelt Park is today. And it was a huge steeplechase barn with an indoor racetrack and an outdoor racetrack around it. Case had a winning horse, J.I.C., who uh, in 1884 became a, a world champion. <coughs> Nobody knew who this factory owner was in Racine, J.I. Case, but everybody knew who J.I.C. was, his horse. He also, the farm extended over to Jerome Park, so there were hundreds of acres west of the railroad tracks. There was about 80 some acres on the east side there by Roosevelt Park. One of the horses that he had, he paid $27,000 for One horse, $27,000. You could buy, with $27,000, you could build 27 houses. 
and really nice houses at that time. You know? So anyways, maybe you had read about or heard about exhuming the bones. I was on a team. We found the bones. You know? It was really cute. <laughs> we had a general idea where the bones were. It was by Walmart out here on Duran. And it was close to electrical tower. We knew that much. So we started out close to the electrical tower. And as time went on, they were moving more and more out into the field. And I thought, who's going to be a horse in the middle of the field? You know, another horse would come and trip in the hole or bust his leg in that softer. So I went into the bushes looking for whatever I could find there. And this other fella came with me. And then I said, look, there were cobblestones and circles around these trees. And I said, look, there's a honeysuckle bush there and 20 feet, another honeysuckle bush, another honeysuckle. This is like a park. There's another one over here, over there. So we walk in a little bit more and here's a bone, a groundhog that woodchuck had dug up a bone. And it was laying there, and I said to that guy, you think that's a horse bone? <laughs> wow! He grabbed it, ran out there, all of a sudden here they come charging back. <laughs> yeah. So we found the bones. I don't know what the rest of the story on the bones are. I guess it's down in my friend's basement. He says they're not winning. <laughs> I don't know. He wanted to put a monument up, but nothing's happening there. So, where was the first factory? Uh, downtown. Anyways, uh, so Chase died in 1891, and uh, the Bull family took over the business. And the Bull family was uh, interested in starting to get into automobiles and gasoline tractors, more modern, more modern things. So, a number of Case executives got on the board of the Pierce Engine Works at 23rd and Mead and bought interest in it. And I, I guess you would call it insider trading when they became corporate members on that board and decided to sell it to Case. So in 1910, Case Company bought the Pierce Engine Company. The building's still standing there at 23rd and Clark. The Pierce Engine Company was the second oldest car manufacturer in the state of Wisconsin. Buildings are still standing there. And Case bought the company and renamed the Pierce Racine car, which was being built there, Case. That's all they did is put a name tag on it, Case, and their serial numbers. And they were using a, a Pierce Racine automobile. That was the Motor Works. Also at the Motor Works, they had the case race teams in the 1910s, 1910, 1911, 12, 13. That was a big deal. All the car manufacturers had race teams and they went all over the country and they, they raced to get the case name out there. Uh, the, the automobiles lasted until about 1925 and they did build a few more models up until like 1927 and a couple in 1928. But the Motor Works is still sitting there and I have the air compressor, the 1905 <laughs> air compressor, out of that factory. And I, I bought it and brought it home, of course. You know, you gotta have an air compressor. <laughs> Big, huge thing. And, that, and I used to sit next to it. And this thing would be running. And it ran from 1905 or whenever they put it in until 1970 when they shut it off. But I used to go and sit back there. I guess you'd call it screwing off. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they had a nice, the millwrights had a nice soft chair there and it was, it was real calming that psh, 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 the steam engine, you know? <laughs> Whoever thought I'd have it in my backyard, you, you never knew. So I was lucky to work at the Motor Works where, where they built the cars. And when I started, I started at the JIK Southworks. Now the JIK Southworks was built basically, they needed more foundry because their business had picked up considerably in the foundry downtown. 
could not service the company anymore. So they planned on building this brand new foundry there in 1910. And since they started building the foundry, they decided to build a new machine shop and storage warehouse. And they were all completed by 1913. In 1913, to show off this monster building, or group of buildings that they had built, they called it a city in itself. They had a Maiden Racine exposition with 166 displays of all different products made in Racine. And one of the major displays, of course, was Case. And in the middle was the bandstand with, of course, Old Abe sitting on the top. So in 1966, when I walked in the gate, the front gate, there were two eagles there on both sides, on the posts. And the Eagles stayed there until 1969, and they were replaced by the Case Mark, more modern because they changing the company. But I'll tell you the sad part, now that I've been lo in local history all these years, <coughs> is when I was working at the Motor Works, the Tenneco gave directions to purge the safes of anything that wasn't, that had a didn't have to be kept by law. And I watched these guys walk out, we, these book organizers, 1899, 1900, all the way through, dumping it all out. The hoppers were full of all these build records and, and, and all this uh, correspondence and everything for the case car and the Mitchell, or not the Mitchell, the uh, Pierce. Pierce, the Pierce cars, and Pierce engines, and that. 69, nobody even thought of that. You didn't have a preservation racine. You know, I'll tell you, the one thing about preservation racine, it, it started enlightening people, educating people, that these things are worth saving, they have some value, and it did make a very big impact on the community. And just going around and looking at some of the beautiful homes that have been restored and people are keeping up. What a landmark, what a landmark. So a couple years later, they needed more space on the second floor for God name, I don't know, I don't know why. And this uh, janitor named Joe, Joe Johnson, he says, you ain't gonna believe this. They told me to throw all them photographs out. There were literally document boxes. There had to be if at least 300 boxes, I would say, full of classic photographs of case, of all their cars, details of the hubcaps and that. The hoppers were coming down off that second floor full. Nobody cared. Nobody cared at all. And <laughs> that wasn't me. That would work good if we had a phone. <laughs> but I, I, grabbed a, I grabbed a stack about two inches tall. You know, I asked the superintendent, his name was Luxem, I says, can I have some of them? Take all you want. And I grabbed a stack there about two inches tall. I don't have those particular photographs today. I sold them at the Seven Mile Fair for a dollar a piece. And at that time, I said, oh my God, a dollar a piece, you know. I probably made a hundred dollars off that little at a dollar a piece. Today, that would have been a couple thousand dollars in photographs because they were classics. They were really nice early views. So anyways, after they uh, built this big salt works and they started building their tractors there and that, that continued on for years and years and years. Then in the war, they start building gun mounts. They start uh, manufacturing bombshells. And they also build a special building to build wings for B-26 bombers. It was called the wing building. And it stayed that way for right to the end, the wing building. And the difference between that building was very little steel was used. It just the steel trusses and everything else was wood and because of the war years. 
Well, the war was over, they never used the wings, they only built a few of them, and that. But in 1978, I think it was 78 or 79, we had that big snowstorm, mm -hmm. and the guys were working in the wing building there, it was mm -hmm. a press room, and all of a sudden they're hearing, pop, <laughs> pop. Mm -hmm. What the hell is that? Mm -hmm. you know, the snapping, the wooden beams were all snapping, there was too much of a snow load up there. Oh. They shut it down, everybody had to get wheelbarrows and shovels and go on the roof and shovel the roofs off so wow. it didn't cave in. <laughs> let there be light. Yeah, let there be a program. I know. <laughs> you are this, this, I'll tell you, this we program. We have four people in this building that have specialty with computers and we're all hustling, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, this program, it started out, you know, I, I, I got in a, a case mark, and then I got the pictures in here, and then a couple of people had seen it, and they asked me, well, could you bring a few pictures in, you know? So I put a bound volume together, a, a volume together with the, the pictures, and I'd come in to work and sit at the lunch table and go through the pictures. And I, oh my God, and yeah, that's that building right over here. And that's a, really, and Case built this, and Case built that? Yeah, they built 36,000 steam engines. Mm -hmm. Not one or two, 36,000. Mm -hmm. In fact, Case Company built more steam engines than all the other companies in the United States combined. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they could. <laughs> the other one was, that case would sell you an engine on credit. All these other manufacturers, you had to have money down and you had to order it. Them big white warehouses that they're gonna tear down in the 1920s, tens, the late 10s and 20s, they were full of steam engines. You ordered one, they'd roll it out and put it on a flat car and send it to you. And that's how it worked. These other companies, they, they couldn't do that. The case could. Hey, you're doing great. Yeah. Is there any questions right. yet? For all the technical difficulties. All the technical difficulties. There's nothing you could do. I mean, what no. are you supposed to do now? No. You just had to. When you talk about steam engines, you're not talking about steam engines that pull trains. No, these are tractors. They're steam tractors. Okay. Yeah, for farm use. Um, they're not locomotives, but they would they would have called them locomotives. You know, Case built. I believe it was five. They called it a hundred and horse, 150 horsepower steam engines. Now, if I had the picture to show you, you'd be amazed because here's this giant engine, and there might have been the guys who might have been a little shorter to take the picture, <laughs> but they were very small standing next to that engine. It was a huge engine. And one of the things was that the Barnum and Bailey Circus had a nickel-plated 150 horse case steam engine, and that led to parade. Wow. When they did their parade, that led the parade. That's one of them that went all over the country, maybe all over the world, you know, and uh, it never survived. Can you tell us a little bit about his personal life, his personality, his, his family? Well, Case was kind of a skin flip. He was very, <laughs> there's stories that say that the newspaper boy came to collect and he didn't have change. So Case told him, well, you go get some change and come back and do business properly. <laughs> That's one of the stories there. Uh, Case did give money to different things, but he wasn't, he wasn't as generous as the Wadowitzes or the Johnsons. Uh, but he did, he did sparingly give money, like building the monument on Monument Square. He uh, contributed money for the Universalist Church. Uh, there was there was a number of things, but he does not have this long list of being the most <coughs> generous person uh, in that respect. Uh, as I said, he was a good businessman because he went out to these farmers. If they couldn't pay, he'd do the bartering system, and he, he gained he gained fame with them. And that uh, he lived he didn't build a fancy house. He lived in a second-hand house on Main Street. I think it was Reuben Norton's house, but don't quote me on that. But it, it was, 
you know, for years his mansion, there's an apartment house there, uh, but the, the stone wall was there for years. And it had case embedded in the, in the step. Now, I think the Heritage Museum took that. I'm not sure, but that's what I've been told. I get all this information, not necessarily that it's true, I, I, you know, but somebody would tell me that. How did he happen to select the eagle? And then why would, did he call it Abe, Old Abe? Old Abe. What does it represent? Uh, well, it was the Civil War Eagle for the Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin Regiment. And, uh, you know, he's right there in the Civil War years. You know, he's like a king of advertising. He wanted to really hit home. Old Abe in Wisconsin was a big deal. The, the company would carry this eagle, and they were called the Eagle Company, and, and it was a real big, so it was real popular. So he wanted to get in on that popularity. I'll tell you another story about Case. There's another, this has got to be an advertising ploy. I mean, you know, he's an older man already in the 1880s, but he went out to Dakota or something like that. And a thrashing machine wasn't working right. So he rolled up his sleeves and he worked on that thrashing machine, you know, and he couldn't get it going. So he took a gallon of gasoline and poured it on it, burned it up. <laughs> I'm so sad a machine like this came out of my factory. You know, if that ain't an advertising deal, but well, that's top of the line. I can't imagine him doing that. But then again, he wasn't real flamboyant. He was a senator. He was involved in government and that. Um, but I'll say this much. You know, when he died, more than one-sixth of the working population of Racine worked at Case. He was the biggest employer. And even, even later, I mean, years later, think of it, 3,500 people when I started there in 66. The employment was just amazing, you know. But when I started there, they were still hauling parts between the South Works and the Motor Works on hay wagons with a tractor going down public streets with hay wagons of parts back and forth. So they were kind of horse and buggy. They were really behind time. And, that, and then Tenneco came in and things progressively got better. Now in my presentation, I show a picture of a guy named James Kettleson. And James Kettleson was a, a uh, corporate executive. He was a bean counter. Well, he kept Case in the black, sitting there every day next to that phone, watching and, and, and kept the company going. His, his uh, pat on the back was he became the chairman of Tenneco. And he had a Case Eagle sitting in the corner of his big office in Houston. And people say, what's that? Well, that's where I started, J.I. Case. But I'll say this much. Then were the days of loyalty. And James Kettleson was loyal to the employees of Case. He worked there, he liked the people. When we had labor contracts, give them what they want. Don't hold it up, give them what they want. We don't have enough work, keep them working. So he went out of his way and I'm sure he was criticized by technical people saying, you're squandering our money, you know, we should dump this company. Because I find it very doubtful without his input, Case Company would still be around. At that time, it was teeter-tottered. In fact, in 1966, when I started there, you couldn't cash a, you couldn't cash a case check anywhere but the bank that it was drawn on. They, no other bank would cash that check. You had to go to the bank that was on that check because they, they were so scared because of the case strikes and the comp company threats of bankruptcy and, and, and things like that. But uh, James Kettleson, our savior, our savior. We can, it's better if you ask me some questions. Jerry, I want to ask you, 
What do you feel about the last of the case buildings downtown coming down? They're collapsing on their own. Unless somebody went in there and, and did something. It was just in the, in the news that uh, the, the warehouses. You know, um, Tom Friedell uh, came to a, a preservation, not preservation, no, history seekers meeting out in Union Grove and I got a chance to talk with him. And uh, we had a little disagreement. I thought, oh, you know, in my vision, I could see condos and river, you know, canals cut, you know, and a river walk and all of that. And he was saying, come on, you're gonna knock all that beautiful history down? And then, eh, yeah. But I was driving around. And I remember the Massey Harris buildings, the Jacobson buildings, the Mitchell Motor Car buildings were here. Bell City was there. This was over here. Walker. Walker. Yeah. You know, Rain Fair, mm -hmm. Hartman Trunk. They're all gone. All these buildings, you know, the Eisendrath Tannery buildings. They're all gone. And these were all things that you'd never think they disappear. And then what happens? The GIK Southworks, 2005. Wrecking ball. This is after they put multi millions of dollars into it, putting in a complete modernized assembly line, painting line, and everything else. They could build 200 tractors a day over there with no problem at all. Now they're probably building about 30 at their, their plant here. But then the market isn't there. You got to have a market. You know. yeah. uh, market like in 19, uh, I'd say 1978, I was uh, managing the tire dock and they were building 150 tractors a day. Not all big ones. About 100 of them were small ones. And they, they were uh, faster tractors because them were the ones they used for backhoes and industrial equipment. But. Uh, can you fill us in on the strike that you mentioned? Well, there was a number of strikes. The 1946 strike was a landmark strike. It was the longest strike in the history of unions in the United States here. They, they threatened everything. They threatened to pull out the, the uh, I got, I think even the president was in on this, trying to get this uh, case company. Leon Claussen wasn't backing off at all. He was going to have his way. It, it was a real terrible strike, and that, but it finally got settled. But that was the longest one in history, of, in a, of case, and supposedly in the country at that time. In 1960, there was another strike, and one of the strikes was uh, the things a closed shop. What was happening is you had a fellow over here that wasn't in the union, a fellow over here that was in a union and they wanted everybody that's working on a machine and that to be in the union and make it a closed shop. Company didn't want that, but after the strike was settled, they did it because it was better to do that. Uh, 1960 was a violent strike. People got hurt. Tony DeLock got run over by a car, but he picketed with, with uh, first with a wheelchair and then, then with crutches. Uh, that's when they, there was a lot of threatening of families and that it was, it was a very terrible time. Uh, I started six years later in 1966 and if I'd go and talk to somebody, the other guys would say, you don't want to talk to him because he crossed the line. He went, he went to work. Now there's all kinds of feelings about unions. I was in the union for the 30 years I was there. Thank God I was, because like, any time I did something naughty, they bailed me out. <laughs> and I wasn't a saint. <laughs> but I didn't go out of my way to get terminated or anything. Mm -hmm. you know? Was yeah. there another question? I'd just like to say that the goodwill, good fellows in the scene was started, I think Roy Spencer was, was mayor at that time. But they, want, they started that to try and mend that feeling between labor and management. 
And that's why we have that Fourth of July parade still in receipt. Yeah, in the 1930s, all the, all the companies were on strike in the 1930s. They, they, Horlick's Malt and Milk, was, uh, William Horlick was devastated. He had people that worked for him for 20 years and that, and they were out on the picket lines. And he was devastated that they were like friends. They started with him in the beginning of that, and he was devastated by it. But Horlick's had problems. Case had always had, Case always had problems. Uh, you know, Bell City had problems. They all, they all took their turns. But in the 1930s, you know, you're in a depression, Money's tight. Everybody wants a little bit of, of a pay raise. Companies aren't selling their products. They didn't have the money. So whatever way you feel about unions, it went this and that, but I'll tell you one thing. The reason people at Twin Disc got pay raises is because the people at Case got pay raises and their union got them for them. And, and healthier conditions and that a lot of companies will do it if they have the income to do it. You take a company like Johnson's Wax, who has a major income from their product, you know, Case only made like 6% after all, everything was paid, they made like 6% for their stockholders. Well, you could, get, you could have got that at the bank, you know. But, uh, yeah, that, but the, the picket lines, I'll tell you about the picket lines. I didn't know much about it, I was on strike. I, I bought my house in 1971, my first house. We went to Racine Savings and Loan to sign the papers. I walked out and on the radio they said, Case just went on strike. Oh. And I, I sat there and I looked at my wife and I says, what, what are we gonna do now? You know, $114 a month? How are we gonna pay it, you know? But yeah, that, that, it only lasted two weeks. And one of the things about it is that they have their problems for a week and then they give it another week for the guys to cool off and they're ready to come back to work after two weeks. They're ready to come back. You know? And since then, the, the, well, they had another one in recent years, but uh, it had been pretty good for a long run there. There was no problems in it. Like I say, for me, it was an excellent place to work. I, I, I couldn't speak higher of it. <coughs> Any more questions? <laughs> you know. That, when you said about the again. checks, how long did that last? Because I don't remember that at all. That was about the same It was time. just a few years. It was a few years. We were never told that in the office. You know, it, it, one of the things was, okay, now, again, I was a younger employee, and I didn't have a checking account and all the, you know, regular accounts like an older, older couples would have at that time. So that might have had a bearing on it. But a number of people that I worked with, they, they didn't. That surprised me when you said that. Yeah. That was something we were never told. Yeah. Um, well, you know, that 1960 strike, my dad had a little corner grocery store with the books. <laughs> if you're on strike, the Piggly Wiggly, it's too bad. You know, uh, Century Store, it's too bad. My dad let the people put it, put it on the books. He lost a lot of money on that because some people gave up and they left. But most people paid their bills and he carried them over. You know, and that was the nice thing about a corner grocery store. And that, I got a kick out of people talking about grocery stores. Man, I worked there. It was nothing but work. You stocked the shelves, you cleaned the coolers, you sorted bottles, you scrubbed the floors. It was nothing but work working in a grocery store. There was nothing romantic about it at all. You know? But in, in 1960, my dad said, come on, kid, come with me. And he got a couple of boxes. He went in a cigarette rack, pulled cigarettes out. He said, go get all the chocolate milks and all the small milks out of the cooler, put them in a the box, piles of Twinkies, little pies, you know, candy bars, put them in a box, and we went from one strike shack to the next. And he handed out these things, a box to each one, down on State Street, out by the Saltworks. And I, I rode along, you know. And he just said, well, these are my customers. They're my friends. And they were having a hard time. And uh, we didn't have a hard time. My dad had a grocery store, we always ate. <laughs> never, not a, I've never had a problem with food. Jerry, I'm not, I'm not from Racine. I'm curious, I've got to go fast forward 
what's the presence today? I know J.I. Case, I see the name around. Is it, did the company take it over? Or what's the it's C&H. C&H. C &H. C &H. Case, New Holland. And when did that happen? <coughs> 2000. 2000. <laughs> you know what? I can tell you what happened 100 years ago. <laughs> You know, in 2007, I did a, a book on postcards in Racine, and I called up down a corporate office trying to find out what name. And they transferred me to legal, they transferred me to this, and they, well, it's this America, it's this and that, and, you know, because the name changes, Case IH, and that. But what was happening is they were losing the, the contact with people because they couldn't relate to the C and H. They can relate to International Harvester, they can relate to Case, but they couldn't, C and H, what's that? Sounds like a sugar company. And so they were having, they were having, and I really don't know, they, they put them on our 20 year banquet, uh, it's C and H. <coughs> and it's, yeah, industrial. I guess, yeah, one of them's industrial. I, you know, I can't keep up with it. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a lot like stores. One day you go there and the next day it's gone. And sometimes the whole building's gone. Everything's gone. You know? Did J.I. Case have any children? Yeah, he had Jackson I. Case. And uh, he had a daughter. He had a couple of daughters and a son, Jackson I. Case. Did they not go into the business, the family business? Uh, when Case, when Jerome Increase di died in 1891, the Thrashing Machine Company was, went to the stockholders. And he owned another company, it was called the J.I. Case Plow Works. That went to the family. And that, that was, uh, they manufactured a Wallace tractor. His son-in-law was Henry Wallace and they named that tractor after him. He, he ran the Wallace Tractor Company. And uh, See, J.I. Case had two companies. He had the J.I. Case Thrashing Machine Company, which still exists today. And he had the J.I. Case Plow Company. Now, one of the Plow Company buildings are still standing there at 6th and Marquette. The building's still there. Then big warehouses belong to the Thrashing Machine Company. And these people keep saying Massey Harris. Massey Harris had nothing to do with the big warehouses. But the buildings across the street, on the south side of Water Street, were uh, J.I. Case Plow Works Company buildings. In 1928, Massey Harris bought this J.I. Case Plow Works and renamed it Massey Harris, and built Massey Harris. But you know, all the while, you had two J.I. Case companies here. So when, when mail came to just J.I. Case Company, mm -hmm. it had to be held at the post office. And representatives from each company would come with their ledgers and go through the mail and see who belonged to who. And at the end of the day, they would split up the new business. And this went on for decades. I mean, just crazy. And then they'd have little things on these plows are not the plows made by the plow works or something like that on their advertisements. It was kind of crazy stuff. Massey Harris stayed here until the 1950s. It became Massey Ferguson, some warehouses and that. They no longer built tractors, you know. But uh, a lot of people thought Case built tanks and that. It wasn't Case, it was Massey Harris that built the tanks. Case made gun caissons or carriages, wings, bombshells. When I worked in a, a big peerless saw, that's another manufactured product from Racine, a peerless saw. I guess there was like 10 of these big saws in a row, and that's all they did all day was cut the tubes for bombshells. And you had 10 men running these saws, and they would cut these tubes and for bombshells, then it'd go to the next thing and that. And, uh, they haven't written a lot about that war, war period in case history. Uh, maybe we should look into that a little bit more. You know, I'll tell you a cute one. I got here, Jerome K. Green. Some of you might remember hearing his name, Jerome Green, if you were from case. But he was a company president. 
And at the same time, I got in this newspaper, and there was a lot of things going on in my life. So he kind of knew of me. Well, I was talking to his right-hand man, the guy, corporate public relations, and I asked him a question, and he says, oh, I'll get back with you. Well, see, in the meantime, my boss and I were having, we worked together for the whole 30 years, but he was having a problem with me. You know, because he told me, you know, there's only room for one bull of the woods here, Jerry. And that's me. I don't know if he was going through some kind of a, you know, change of life. But anyways, he was really starting to ride me and, and different things. But what happened was, is this Rick James, that corporate communications guy, told Jerry Green to give me a call with the information. Well, he tried to call my number, but he couldn't get through, so he called my boss's number and said, can I talk to Jerry Karwalski? <laughs> well, who is this? Oh. Jerry Green, who is this? Oh, boy. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, anyways, <laughs> my boss comes running down. What's this all about? What's this all about? I says, well, he's a personal friend of mine. <laughs> Never a problem after that at all. I buffaloed him, and that's all I did is he gave me the information I wanted. It was probably for a story, you know, how many employees or, or something, you know, it was probably for a story. But it was pretty cute. It was <laughs> so, I love it when you ask questions. How about any other historical information? Not related to case. Or the smalted milk? <laughs> Johnson's Wax. What do you know about the baseball teams? That, uh, the baseball teams? Yeah. Not a lot. <laughs> but we did add, we, we did add a, a, the Cardinals. There was, there was a real early, uh, I don't know, American League or National League baseball team in Racine at one time. Women? Oh, the Bells? These were the, the Bells. This was their company team. I mean, Case had a company team. Oh, Those yeah, I don't know much about this. Probably okay. Yeah, no, the, they, they, they had a lot of, in fact, I. Uh, I looked in the Case Marks and the Case Eagles that I have to see if I could find yeah. your dad in there. Yeah. And he wasn't, they have a lot of pictures of sports teams. And all, all the companies had their sports teams. It was real popular. Other companies? <coughs> they played against each other, yeah, different companies. Massey Harris would play against Modine. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they were all in the city here. Company, all the teams. Okay, do you know where Case Harmon Park is? Case Harmon Park. Yes. It's north of Durand and it's east. In Jerome Park? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I was told that the horse used to run around that park. No. 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 Okay. The racetrack was on by Roosevelt Park. But that was uh, that Jerome Park over there. Everything from Durand Avenue, the railroad tracks to DeCoven was pretty much Hickory Grove Farm. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what the total west, uh, street to the west was, uh, but the original, one of the original farmhouses is still sitting there. It's kind of set back and the, there's modern houses around it. Here's this little Greek revival and that was like the ranch hand or the farm hand's bunkhouse there. Uh, all back where Jerome Park is, there was all stock barns and for case uh, they bred horses there. They actually had books and in stick of their breeding stock and, and all about their horses. So, I mean, they, they did have thousands of animals that they had there. So why do you think the horses' bones were found out last year? No, that was, that was a, a, a bull farm. That was a family relative. They buried it out on that farm. I think it was Charles Bull. They buried it out on his farm. For what reason they chose that spot, I really don't know. But J.I. Case was already dead because J.I.C. lived to be 31 years old and died in 1909. So I, I, believe, I believe Case was dead in 91, and I'm pretty sure that his son Jackson I. Case had already passed away. So how did the bulls get connected to the Case? Yeah. Uh, J.I. Case married Stephen Bull's sister. Okay. Yeah. So Stephen Bull and 
Yeah, and then Stephen Bull was an early employee. You had the big four. You had J.I. Case, Robert Baker, the Baker Block. You had Mezzadina Erskine, and Stephen Bull, the big four. Uh, Mezzadina and Erskine's mansion was at 11th and Main, where that big white church is. It was a beautiful mansion. Unbelievable mansion. Five inch thick bird's eye walnut door, bird's eye <clears throat> doors, and, and it was it was in a kind of an East Lake period. Very, very decorative. In fact, I have a hinge from one of the doors. The hinge is beautiful and ornate. Stephen Bull lived on the corner of uh, 11th Crow Kitty Corner, 11th and Main. And East Towers is built on that property. Frank K. of Bull, J.I. Case's son, lived next door, another mansion. Uh, these were still standing, you know, until they tore them down for East Park, or the East Park Towers, you know, and that. You know, normally I don't do these programs. I always tell everybody, I don't do these programs anymore, you know? <laughs> but then Pam Murphy over there said, Jerry, can you do a program? <laughs> And then everything goes wrong. <laughs> well, everything went wrong today. But maybe we'll have another chance at some time. We could do it again. <laughs> I'll tell you about it, though. Because I had this love and this uh, interest in the history of Case, they asked me to talk at the J.I. Case 20-year club. At that time, the 20-year club was held at Memorial Hall. Shoulder-shoulder oh. shoulder crowd. There was over 1,200 people And the there. presentation worked. And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it worked that And you time. missed it. Yeah. But there was over 1,200 people. It was a, you know, 20 year club is big. It's a big, big company, a lot of, a lot of people. But uh, it turned out real well that time. But we'll have another chance. We can I, have another I, chance. But that was the first time that um, any presentation got a standing ovation. Okay, <laughs> stand up. This is, this is my daughter, Aria, and she had put together the presentation for the 20 year club. I put together present the presentation you were supposed to see today, I put together for the um, yeah. 20 year club. And we did a, a dry run that day. And I think we should have done a dry run this today, obviously, for technical difficulties. But. Um, in the history of the 20 year club for J.I. Case, it was a standing ovation for his presentation. Oh. And I didn't even know that. And he didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't and guys were coming up to me and telling me this has never happened before in the history of yeah. this ever. And it was well, all I was the, I was the so been first non corporate speaker. They always had the, the chief engineers and this talking about the new product lines and. And, and boring stuff, and, you know. And, <laughs> they had like charts and statistics. And I remember and plenty of times where I went to the 20 year club and, you know, whoever was up there was talking and everybody else, they're talking to you, you know. But he wasn't even there. He's talking to people that weren't even listening to him, you know. But I got their attention. And one of the things that I had is one of my first slides was the lighthouse that stood right on this site that was built in 1839. And I put up library. this. Make sure they know it's the library site. The library site right here. Right here. Right here. <laughs> but there, 1839, the Root River Lighthouse was built here. And that caught their attention. Really? They had something like that where the library is across the street? Yeah. And then I went on to talk about uh, Racine in 1841. I showed downtown the, the Main Street view and then. Gilbert Knapp kind of pops up off to the side. This is all stuff that you should be seeing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do another presentation. Yeah, yeah. Make sure that the technicalities are done. Yeah. yeah. Do it at the Memorial Hall. Yeah, I think that they, maybe it's bad to they, use I want to I wanna say this was that was in 2007. It seems like yesterday. And here it's 11 years ago already. You know, I started doing presentations Right around 1977, 78. Okay. Uh, first, I, I uh, was asked, I, I uh, had a newspaper article saying I was writing a booklet on, on Racine Breweries. 
So then after that article came out, I got school teachers asking me, could you come and talk to my class? And then a few people said, well, why don't you put a kind of a presentation together? Oh, okay, put a presentation together. <laughs> and then uh, about 1978, I did it for Preservation Racine. And uh, the, the head guy at that time in charge of the, the programs was George Blastein. And he says, well, what's the name of your program? I said, I don't know. <laughs> well, you got to have a name for your program. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's just Racine history. I think we're going to go back to slides. <laughs> <laughs> it was such I a simpler slide. time. <laughs> so he, he termed Racine in history. That's what it was. And then, you know, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83. 150th anniversary of the city of Racine. I had my calendar full. Every little church group, <laughs> school groups. Oh, you know, it was just absolutely amazing. I was in big demand. And I had a tuxedo with a top hat. <laughs> Didn't wear it all the time, but a lot of times I did. And it was kind of entertaining. I still have that old thing. Mm -hmm. you know? Maybe you should have wore it tonight. You could have entertained. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were discussing a cowboy hat versus my old clearing hat. Yeah, yeah. I know you're somewhat modest, but have you received any honorary degrees from local colleges or universities? No. Oh. And he should. And he should. He, should. he really should, yeah. No. Before we... I have a question for you. The Sage Houses. Uh, for those of you who kind of heard a little bit, the Lakota group has been hired by our city to kind of look at all of our historic buildings. And they're in the process of doing it. I'm sure they're doing a wonderful job. And Brad and Carol at the gallery, the first Friday in July, is going to do a special exhibit on cream brick buildings in the scene. And I just want you, you said anything about history. And one day you said, maybe the city should take those buildings down in front of the Sage Mansion. I wonder how many, I just want you to say a sentence or two. I don't think most people even know they're there. Sydney Sage? Mm -hmm. The Sydney Sage Mansion, yeah, it's between there. Peck Avenue and Wilson Street. You'd never know it. If you come down Wilson Street, you'll see this school-like building. It actually was an Italian mansion that faced State Street. A lot of the, the, the porch and that uh, brackets are still on it. It faced State Street, but as property became more valuable and old historic homes were down the tubes, nobody wanted them. They were too, too much to heat and things like, you know, through the Depression, war years, that took a big effect on these houses. Who can pay the bills, the taxes, and things like that. But anyways, they put a block of buildings all in front of it. So all, mm -hmm. sold off all the lots, and all the property behind it, and so here you've got a building. But in 1910, this Sage House was remodeled into a building called the Central Association. And it was basically, well, eh, not exactly a YMCA and not exactly a homeless shelter, but it was somewhere in that area. They took care of children. Um, I, I can't come up with the exact... Whole house. A what? Whole house. Whole house. No. Whole She's saying whole house, house like whole they house? did in Chicago. It was oh. family services in the 50s. Yeah, family, family services. services. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that's what it was used for. And I mean, when I was a kid, that's kid. There was a lot of kids there, on the playgrounds and that. And the addition, the one thing is, I got the architectural drawings where the uh, architect followed the lines when they enlarged the building. They made it twice the size, but they more or less followed the architecture. So, but it's, it looks like a little old schoolhouse building. But it was actually a mansion. Uh, the Sage family, Joel Sage bought a, a parcel of 177 acres west of the river and north of the river and up to about Prospect Street and all the way out to the tracks. About 177 acres there. And then he subdivided it. It was called Sagetown. 
Yes, I know. My parents bought a house there, and I lived there until I was 22 years old. Yeah. And the street was Dowd Street, which no longer exists because Garfield School took it over. There you go. So, it's one of, one of the interesting things about Sage Town is it has all the Great Lakes for the streets, Ontario, all but Michigan. Michigan's over on the lakefront. Mm, yeah. But it's got all Sinclair Street was there. Mm, and, then, and then also you had Marquette, mm. LaSalle, mm -hmm. and then you went into good old Silver Street. Mm. Dowd was a uh, governor. Mm. Peck was a governor. Mm. Garfield, a president. Mm -hmm. So th the streets are all kind of patriotic in, mm. in the Sage Town area. Racine was divided up Sage Town school section and Canada. Everything north of the river was Canada. <laughs> this is, they called it Canada. That, that was, and if you lived in Sagetown, you were west of the river. And if you lived in the school section, you were here on the south side. And that, but yeah, the Sage, I don't know if, the, is the Sage, Stephen Stage House still standing there on Superior Street? Yep. Okay. Yes. That's still there? I think it's like an adventure. Yes. My problem is that, as somebody mentioned, I've been in this for 50 years, but I've been in it longer than that because I'm 70. And, and uh, I don't know, I guess I was noticing things that the average person had noticed back then. When we were kids, we'd play in a foundation and, and we're playing cops and robbers or whatever your kid does in, you know, or in a fort like. Mm -hmm. And then later on you found out that this building was there. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what was on that foundation. That's why that foundation was there. It's kind of unique. The case factories, I don't know, eight, ten years old. Fence post eagle, that's what this is. This was a... This was a gift they gave when you retired back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. they, they, gave, they gave you a case pedestal like this. Not everybody got them, but I mean, a lot of retirees got that. Now they generally gave tractor, like when I retired, they gave a toy tractor, you know. Toy tractor? Yeah. <laughs> I sold that, I didn't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it had the wrong name on it, you know. But, I don't know, 810, uh, running around. We used to go down and play in the plants. Every so often the, the guards would chase us up or something like that. But in the old case plant complex, there was a bunch of fences and on all of the fence posts were case eagles. Okay. Yeah. So we went home and got a pair of pliers <laughs> and we brought them home and that's the end of the story. I don't know what ever happened to him. I, I, I recall we buried him in the backyard, but I'm sure somebody <laughs> told my dad that we buried him in the backyard. So he dug him out and took him back to Case, you know, and that, because we weren't supposed to have him. Either that or they're still buried in the backyard and we just forgot about it. But yeah, I got into so the So you want to go dig up some bones? <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, naughty, naughty Jerry, I mean, you know. But it was a lot of fun. And, and the thing is that I never thought I was going to work at Case. I put in my application at Jacobson and Twin Disc and <coughs> Gold Metal Furniture and that. Mm -hmm. And this whirlwind thing of going in there and, uh, you know, that afternoon I'm working there. And then 30 years later. And the one thing was the girl that took, uh, her name was uh, Karen Hamilton. Her name was Karen Christensen. Her mother was the police lady, Roberta. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> old friends. But she went to the same school, Garfield School. I went to Garfield School as a kid. And she was a couple grades higher. Like I was in the fourth, she's in the sixth. But she took care of my retirement. And then when we got done, she started to cry. And I said, well, what did I do? And she says, you didn't do anything but I will never have what you have here because I was 48 years old and I was never laid off in 30 years. Not one day. Plant shutdowns, yes. When the whole plant was shut down, I was off. 
but how in God's name do you work in the same place for 30 years and never get laid off one day for an average person? Average person, they, they end up with five, six jobs, you know, or some people, a hundred jobs in their lifetime. And, then, and I only had three. Ray Joe Motors, J.I. Case, and the Yorkville Recycling Center. <laughs> I don't know if they call that a job. But it was just like Case, they said the reason they would never fire me, they didn't have, they, they didn't know what to put in what I did. And it would have been so embarrassing that they'd ask, what did he do here? We, we don't know. Okay, one more little thing. He presses the button. <laughs> one more little thing is, uh, you know, I know I was loved there mm -hmm. because I come to work in factory workers. It's always cutting up something. And everybody I passed said, hi, Blossom. Mm -hmm. Hi, Blossom. Mm -hmm. Finally, I go to the lunch table. What the heck is this Blossom? And the spokesperson gets up, Jerry, you're a blooming idiot. <laughs> we decided to call you Blossom. <laughs> now you know you're loved. <laughs> then there was one more where in the newspaper the reporter said Jerry said that he's kind of a strange guy <laughs> they went up in the blueprint room had that thing blown up <laughs> they hung it over my desk and underlined it with yellow <laughs> and then I came in I looked at that and I could hear him back there you know and all of a sudden they said we agree 100%. <laughs> yeah. Is there any other questions? I, I just had a thought. Um, do, do you or could you do a program on how lots of Racine streets got their names? Or yeah. Who they were for? yeah. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could put yeah, something together easy. on that. I think that'd be interesting. Yeah. A lot of their, the streets have changed because there was names like Barnstable and mm. Campbell and, you know, mm. Pearl Street and different names that were the pioneer names and then they changed them to College Avenue, Park Avenue. Yes. Instead yeah, of Chippewa, I think it became Villa, you know, okay. that type of thing. Just one question, I met you years ago when you were the bottle man. Yeah. Because I was behind the AGCA. Do you know why that man stopped brewing, brewing here, the heck brewery? He was the, the heck brewery? He, he quit in the 1880s, he probably just retired because he started in the 1840s, 1848, so, yeah, uh, Fred Heck, Fred Heck ended up in Milwaukee, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, any other questions, anything related to Racine, I, I mean, you know, I'm supposed to be somewhat of authority at times. I have a book, actually, I don't want to call it a book, or like a catalog from Bell City. My dad was there for 30 years and my brother for 20. I don't want to throw it away. Who can I donate it to for the history of Bell City? Because it gives from the beginning to how many blocks they had for their offices. Um, I, I collect all of that. <laughs> but my, then the one thing is that uh, you, you turn around and you get caught up in this stuff. I was researching on breweries and I come here to the public library, which is, this is a temple. I mean, this is a temple. I never got a raw deal here at all, ever. They treated me like a king and that, and this was like my temple. The only thing is that at nine o'clock the library is closed or whatever time it was and it was <laughs> broke my heart that I had to go home because I was on the microfilms for hours. You couldn't go on the internet on the old newspapers and things that you have today. If you wanted to find out when something burned down, you had to go year by year by year and look and look and look. It was quite a lot of work and everything. But I'm so glad that the public library was here. And like I say, they're always wonderful. But I'll give you one, one little story about the public library. I was in the microfilms and you had to go to the reference desk every time and ask and then they would send the girl and then she would pick the film for you. Well this girl's going all night, all night. <laughs> Finally she said, 
when you're done with it, put it on top. Do not file it. Put it right on top here. You know, okay. So I'm there looking at films. So I'm down on my hands and knees in the bottom drawer looking at a film. And all of a sudden I look and here's this pair of shoes. <laughs> and these nylons, black nylons, and then a lower skirt that was odd, you know, back in the 70s and 80s with the lower skirt. And then I looked up and it was Norma Deck. Mystic. The librarian. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I'm looking at microfilms. <laughs> you know you're not supposed to be in them drawers, you know. <laughs> Slam the drawer. You go through the proper process. Go up to the reference desk and ask, you know. Okay, Mrs. Deck. <laughs> Well, that was a fun day here at the library. But I, <laughs> and then after that, some of the other libraries, they would let me go by the city directories and that because they got kind of tired going down and continuously bringing them up. And they said, well, okay, you promise you're not going to do anything down there outside and look at the directories? Yeah. And, and then they'd let me, because I was coming here researching a lot. And it took a lot of research back then. My God, I, I turned around, I got on Facebook, and then all of a sudden these people are popping off with all these dates and everything. And I'm like, how in the hell? How do they know this? How did? And then I find out that the newspaper archives, you can go on and, and you can pull them up. And you put in a name and you, well, all this information. My God, I had to sit there for hours and hours and hours just looking for one thing. And that, it's, it's a miracle for the new people. I don't know if there's a lot of new people that are that interested. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully there is. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some young people that like history. <laughs> <laughs> Did Case get into private labeling the old oil or tires or any other parts? Uh, I don't think so. I, they, they have products made and they package them in their, their labels. Uh, but I don't... I don't, I don't recall anything like that uh, through the years. The one thing, you know, like the JIK Saltworks, anything mechanical, like a car or a tractor or an airplane or anything that you could machine and, and make by machining that, you could build anything in that factory. It was absolutely amazing, all the different machinery and everything. And, and uh, they were set up where, you know, you could convert it into an automobile factory and that if, if you wanted to but that's all gone now it's all gone just in time came in and all of that and there they went jobs went out the door mm -hmm. any other uh, i presume you know where the case eagle went from the front of the building it's still up there well we got one from the front front of the building at the high school in eau claire when, when uh, okay that that be a different eagle the Eagle on the Case Corporate Office building is part of the building. They took it down and they said, no, 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 it's part of the architecture. It's got to go back up. Oh, so they cleaned it and they put it back up on the... Was there one at the, at the plow, at the tractor work? Yeah, there was a big one at the, the tractor plant. That's there was a one, real big yeah, one. That's up in Eau Claire at our high school. Okay. we were the old days. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And at the Saltworks, there were two smaller ones. They were about three foot tall at the main gate. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then there was a great big one yeah. that mm -hmm. was on the end yeah. that you could see from Racine Street uh, in Durand there. Maybe a that's real big the one. one you got. In 1970, they took all them eagles down and they called all the eagles back from the uh, branch offices. A lot of them came back. And then they filled out raffle tickets you put your name on a raffle ticket to get an eagle and then uh, any employee could put their name in and there was you know a number of the four footers kind of floating around there's another collector in time, town his name is John Apple in the Racine labor paper a paper that was years ago uh, had a case eagle and a phone number boy I'm calling I want to find out about this case eagle and a phone number. And you call and call and you, it went like busy. 
Well, John Apple took the phone number, went in the city directory, looked up the address, crossed it with the name, and then looked up the address and he drove over there. And he says, how much you want for the Eagle? He says, you're the first guy that I've talked to about the Eagle. You know, here his phone wasn't working right. <laughs> you know, and the guy gave him a price and he says, I'll take it, you know. But boy, that was a good, Good thinking on Jan Apple's part. You got a, one of the four foot eagles. One more question. One more question? Make it a good one. <laughs> How old am I? No, if someone doesn't, I have a question. I was told that Clinker had had a partner at some point in his brewery, because you said you were doing brewing stuff. I was told by a lady in a nursing home that under Washington Avenue, between downtown and uptown, that he had a cave where he aged his beer. What do you think the chances are that that cave is still under Washington Avenue? It could be. Uh, one day Washington Avenue might start caving in, and, then, <laughs> and that, that's happened, and then they find out that there was a, there was a cave underneath it or whatever. Uh, yeah, that, the lager beer process was keeping it in a cool, cool area. That was oh. real common for We're that process of manufacturing. We need a field <laughs> trip. <laughs> I don't think the city would be happy Two if we start digging up Washington Avenue. found <laughs> under Washington Avenue looking for mysterious. Well, anyways, I won't take any more of your time. And I, you know, it technically we blew up. It uh, happens. It happens. And that, but you know. We'll There'll be another one. time. We will do That's another nice. one. Yeah. And we will do a dry run through and make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.